All right, so we, we begin today with our first speaker, Miguel, who's going to talk about bootstrapping bulk locality. Um, okay. Well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's always a great pleasure to be uh, in Florence. Uh, so my talk is uh, about work in progress that I'm doing with Nat Levine at the Col Normal, uh, entitled Bootstrapping Bulk Locality. So there's a bit of ground to, to cover explaining the setup, so I hope I don't go too much over time. I think we have 10 minutes canonical uh, on top of the, the usual time, right? So, um, so perhaps the simplest way to start explaining what we're trying to do is to consider a setup where you have uh, a quantum field theory that you put in anti deceiver space. Okay. So this is ADS. Um, so to put a QFT in ADS, you have to make several choices. You have to introduce some cover, uh, couplings to curvature. You have to choose boundary conditions and so on. But in principle, there are usually many ways in which you can do this, at least if the radius of ADS is sufficiently large. And under this, uh, these uh, circumstances, then you have access to a new class of interesting observables in your QFT, which are conformal correlators. So the conformal correlators that you can obtain is so you, if you start off with some correlation functions inside ADS, and now you take the, the boundary limit, so you have some fields, and now you push them towards the boundary, then you can show that uh, this behaves in every way As a, as a conformal correlation function in a CFT, okay? Meaning that these objects, which are like boundary components of these fields, they behave in every way as primaries in a, in a CFT, and these correlators, they satisfy the conformal ward identities, okay? So this is very interesting because, I mean, this QFT had, uh, has a mass gap and so on, it has nothing to do with conformality, and yet now we can study it uh, via these conformal observables, and for these, okay, we have a lot of techniques. We have the, the conformal bootstrap techniques to, to, to study them, and so by studying this side, we can learn about QFTs in ADS, um, and uh, so there are several motivations for doing this. One motivation is, uh, is simply in holography. Suppose that you want to study just local or approximately local observables in the theory of quantum gravity, so we expect that when M Planck is very large, we have ac access, you know, approximately local op uh, operators exist. So you might want to know, for instance, how does, uh, in N equals four super young mills, how can one construct something that behaves like an approximately local operator in ADS? Uh, the other motivation is simply, uh, again, as a probe of the QFT, even if you don't care about QFTs in ADS, you might wonder, well, how do I extract the, the flat space physics, so something that, hap that happens in a very small patch here inside the VDS where I can neglect curvature, how can I access these physics from these, uh, these correlators? And that there are indeed ways uh, to do this. This has been studied in, in recent years. Um, so, okay, so we have all these motivations. And so the, the goal of this talk is to describe a bit how you, you go from here to here, okay? So of course, if you have this set of correlators in ADS, you can obtain these conformal correlators, but you might wonder, how would I know, given a CFT, uh, how would I know that uh, uh, there exists some approximately local dual associated to it? How would I build a, a local operator starting from the CFT data, okay? So this is the question. In other words, so if I put some if I put some operator here, say, how should I think of the state that's created by my field phi as a CFT state? How would I characterize it? Uh, and so the key constraint uh, is that uh, 
the key constraints uh, that these fields have to satisfy is that they have to be local, and so locality for me is simply the statement that objects must commute at space-like separations. Okay, so you can you can concoct some some something that look like fields in ADS, but then really the the litmus test is to check that in ADS if they are space-like separated, then they should commute. And this is not uh, it's not trivial to obtain such operators. Okay, so this talk is about how do you build these special CFT operators that behave as local bulk fields. I should also say that um, there's a, another, uh, there's a special case of this construction, which might be of interest, which is when the case where this QFT is a CFT. Okay, so that is when the bulk theory itself is also a conformal field theory. Because in this case, this, set, this setup is equivalent, is conformally equivalent to uh, what people call BCFT. Okay, that is when you have a CFT on a half space. So this is easy to see because, for instance, you can put the metric, uh, the ADS metric is, I would choose coordinates du squared. Okay, in some patch you can write it like this. So by the way, I'll take the boundary. So this is always ADS d plus one. So the boundary is d-dimensional. And so you see by a conformal mapping, so the, the so you, ranges between zero and infinity with u equals zero being the boundary of ADS. And so you see that if I remove this factor, this just looks like a half space, okay? And so there the question then is if you have access to the boundary CFT operators, how could I reconstruct the, the bulk operators? So this problem has also been considered in the bootstrap uh, community a long time ago, but there the logic was a bit different because there you have a crossing equation because the bulk, the bulk fields also satisfy an OPE. But here in my set, setup, they, will, they won't. Or I, I, will, I will not uh, explicitly use that fact. Um, so questions about this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, so the techniques that I will describe, they can be applied for, for BCFT. Indeed, they are not known. In BCFT, the only thing that's been done is write down a crossing equation for the two-point function of a bulk field. Here, I will not consider the two-point function. The two-point function, in a sense, is too trivial for what I want to discuss. Uh, sorry, this way or this way? Um, a unique set of operators. I mean, <clears throat> what I can say is that uh, the same QFT, there are many ways in which to put it into ADS. And so, for instance, there will be many sets, families of CFTs that could describe the flat space limit of any given QFT. I don't know if that's what you're saying. Otherwise, if you're asking, are there many ways to group together local operators to form a bulk field? Probably not. I think there should be just one way at most. And even that is very constrained. Um, okay, so people, of course, have considered this problem uh, in the past. So, as far as I know, the first work uh, is uh, by Benna. So, I think this is already from 99. And then there was a lot of work by these people. So, Hamilton, uh, Kabat, uh, Lifshitz and low, and especially these two. So they have a lot of uh, joint uh, papers that came out after the initial works. Uh, and so there's something called the HKLL construction, which I'll describe very briefly because it's not my main purpose, but so th what they did is that they, they expressed a field in ADS um, as some integral over the boundary of ADS, some kernel uh, with which you smear uh, a, pri uh, a primary field in, uh, in, in the CFT. So let me explain a bit notation. So I will, X is ADS point, and P is a boundary of ADS point. It's 
So it's shorthand for people who know embedding formalism, you know why I'm using this notation. If you don't, it's not relevant. You should just think of this. Uh, and sometimes I will use ADS coordinates. Uh, they will be u and little x. And boundary coordinates, they will just be little x. Okay? And so what these people said is, okay, if you start off with the primary operator and you smear it with some kernel and you integrate it, actually, this, this is not, this is a region. This is some region contained in the boundary of ADS. Then you can obtain an operator that, uh, that behaves as a, as a local field, at least at the level of, of two-point functions. Okay? And their construction is Lorentzian, so this integral has to be done over some complexified region. Uh, and so this is the, the thing that these people, uh, people that study holography and quantum gravity, they talk about this entanglement wedge and blah, 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 and that operators can be defined in terms of the data at the boundary of this entanglement wedge. So they basically, they always use this construction. Okay? So this has the property that this region, as the, the operator approaches the boundary, the size of the region shrinks to zero, as you expect. Um, and so more generally, uh, what these people say is that in the presence of interactions, then in principle you have to sum over many operators in the CFT, and you smear them with this kernel. This kernel also depends on the scaling dimension. Uh, and you have to tune these coefficients in a, in a certain way such that you get a local uh, operator in, in the bulk. Okay. So I'm not really super happy with this construction because I get confused about these kernels and the fact that you're in Lorentzian, so then I don't know when this is supposed to converge or not, for which kinematics. So I'll do a, a more down-to-earth uh, construction using things that bootstrappers know and love, namely bas basically OPEs, and in this case it will be a, a boundary operator uh, expansion. So what is the boundary operator uh, expansion? Yes? So the claim is that, so if you just have a single operator, this, this k is such that this field satisfies the free ADS wave equation. Sorry? Yes, but then once you sum over many states, this is not true. Yeah, it's the same kernel. Yes. That's the claim. But you know, the, when they construct this kernel, for instance, you have to assume some analyticity properties of Whiteman functions, and it seems like when you have many points, these analyticity properties are not true. So, you know, I don't know. Yes. So this will be the key, any, well, this will be the key point of my talk anyway, is that you have to be very careful about this. Uh, but, I mean, effectively, and to their credit, is that what I can say is that, in a sense, this expansion can be rigorously justified, and the only thing that you need to change is that this kernel becomes some differential operator, as we are used in, in OPs, and now you're not in Lorentzian, it's, it's Euclidean, and then everything makes sense. This expansion has a finite radius of convergence. So, um, so, so let me just explain the, the, the state operator correspondence. Um, so we are all familiar with the state operator correspondence in CFTs, but the point is that the state operator correspondence still holds in this setup when you have a QFT in ADS, okay? And basically because of the same reasons, uh, so if I can consider global ADS, and I have some state that lives here on some time slice at time t, uh, then I can act with the Hamiltonian in ADS. The Hamiltonian in ADS is nothing but the dilatation operator of the boundary theory, and I can push this circle down to the infinite past. And in ADS, I can do a coordinate transformation, so it's not a conformal transformation. So for the CFTs, you have to do a conformal transformation to go from the cylinder to the plane. But in ADS, you just do a coordinate transformation. Uh, so this is the same, at least in some patch, as this, so my U coordinate is increasing this way, this is my boundary CFT, this is ADS, and so this circle now becomes a, a horosphere, okay? 
And so if you send it to the infinite path, the, sense of this, the, the size of this sphere shrinks to zero, so you can think that you can associate it to, a, to a, a local operator. And indeed, so eigenstates of the Hamiltonian in ADS, they simply map onto uh, primary operators in this boundary CFT. Okay? So this implies that there's, a, there's something called, there's a, a boundary operator expansion. So for instance, if I have a, 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 a bulk field that I've inserted here, then it's living here inside this sphere. And so by, I can expand it in a basis of CFT states. Okay, so the claim then is that psi x acting on the vacuum can be expanded in the basis of eigenstates of the dilatations. Um, uh, well, so this is some state in the CFT, so I must be able to expand it in the basis of eigenstates of dilatations. So this prime just means that I have to sum over descendants as well. Um, and so, so now the next step, what you want to do is to group the contributions of descendants together, right? Because they should be fixed by conformal invariance, and indeed they are. And so there are two ways to do this. Uh, perhaps the simplest way is, simple, is simply to consider uh, a two-point function of a CFT primary with, a, uh, with an ADS field. So this two-point function is completely fixed by the isometries of ADS. You have no freedom to, to define what it is. It's, it's, you can give it up to a constant. So this is basically u divided by u squared plus x squared to the delta times some constant, mu delta. And so basically demanding consistency of this two-point function with this OPE, with this BOE. So I should write boundary operator expansion. It's important. The main inconsistency of this expression with this BOE fixes the contributions of descendants, and so the upshot um, is that you can write an expression that looks like, like this. So psi, well, maybe I should find a better place to do it. So BOE, psi of x u, is equal to the sum over primaries, some coefficients that depend on the particular operator. Uh, and then there's a certain differential operator that depends on, on delta, depends on, on u times box, acting on a primary operator of dimension delta. So if this is a scalar field, then these fields necessarily must be scalars. These are the only operators that can appear in this expansion. Okay, and so this is some differential operator, and you can write it down explicitly. Okay, it's just some infinite sum of powers of, of u squared box. Okay? Questions about this? This is, uh, it's this argument. So this creates some state. It's not a conformal primary indeed. It's some state in, in ADS that has to transform as a scalar in ADS. Any state I can expand in the basis of, of eigenstates of dilatations, because they form a basis for my Hilbert space. So that expansion holds. And then I'm just saying that the coefficients of descendants in that expansion are fixed by those of the primary. But you see, I still have lots of freedom because these coefficients, I don't know what they are at this point. I just know that this expansion must hold, and, and I know where this expansion uh, can converge. So this, con this expansion converges, basically, whenever I can draw a horosphere that contains my operator psi. So if my CFT insertions are out here, then the BOE will converge, and then as one of these, approach, these operators approaches this region, the BOE will stop converging. Yes? That's one way to do it, yes. Uh, 
the, well, we don't know what, I'll, I'll talk about the three-point function momentarily. You see, you have this freedom uh, to choose these coefficients. So in general, the answer will depend on all these coefficients. I'll tell you how to fix them. This is the, the constraint is that things should be local. This will help at least partially to fix them. But so here it's clear that there is convergence. Yes? What's the usual picture? The usual picture is free theory. Sure. These are, this is sum over all primaries in your boundary CFT. You see, this psi of x, when you put a bulk operator acting in the center of the ADS, this has some very complicated representation in terms of CFT operators. This is the representation. So acting with this object at some point here is the same as acting with this complicated superposition of boundary operators on the vacuum. And as the operator gets pushed to the boundary, then the BOE truncates, and you just get a few, the, the most singular contribution first, and so on. Okay, so we are using ADS-CFT that the scalar field talks to about one boundary operator, but this is an approximation. This is just approximation perturbation theory. At leading order, this is true. And even at leading order, if you look at, I'll show you an example, if you look at composite operators, then this boundary operator expansion contains an infinite number of operators, even in free theory. But is this an assumption? This equation that phi x sub zero is... This? This, the two-point function? No, this is not an assumption. This is the state operator correspondence, which holds. So the statement is, this is some state in the CFT. I can decompose it into a complete set of states. That's it. There are many primaries, there are many states in the CFT, so in general, this operator will talk to all of them. This is just some very complicated, it's not an eigenstate, right? Yes? Yeah. That's the point. This this works for QFT in ADS. All the everything that I said is for QFT in ADS. The only situations where this is well, the only so if there's gravity, what goes wrong with this construction is that there are no local operators at all, and this is because operators are not gauge invariant. But even in that case, you can the way you should think about it is that an operator gets dressed by some Wilson line. And so the Wilson line will violate the, locate the locality conditions, but it will violate it just a little bit. So in fact, the construction that I will describe, you can use it even in that case. If you know what the, the non-locality is supposed to be, then the construction will still allow you to fix what these coefficients are supposed to be. Yes? Does the operator content of the QFT depend on the CFT or not? Sorry? Does the local operator content of the QFT depend on the CFT or not? No. You have a QFT, the field content is the same in whatever background you put it, right? The local field content. This is the QFT operator in ADS, in ADS. period, no limit. What is the this is the vacuum of the theory, empty ADS, no fields acting anywhere. Yes. Excuse me? Is it a confusion because I use this funny notation with big X? Yes. Ah, <laughs> okay. Then if you want, this is U little x. It, it is not. It is not. So, you know, now there's these fancy words about quantum error correction that operators can be written as different regions in the boundary. Here, it's, it's, tri it's trivial. I mean, any operator, so if I put an operator here, I can draw a sphere like this, or I can draw a sphere like this, or there are many ways in which to do the BOE, and they must all be equivalent. But this isn't, this isn't some fancy quantum gravity property. It's just true for any QFT in ADS. It's just I can do radial quantization about any point that I want. Um, 
yeah, so this is one, uh, well, maybe it's u to the delta, uh, it's u to the delta, one plus u squared box times some number plus, excuse me? No, this is a, the f box little x. It's d two x. It just acts. Yeah, maybe this is a bad choice to to think about this big x. Maybe this is why people are getting confused. I wanted to save time, but now I'm wasting time. Um, so there's little x and there's u. So this guy depends on u. These guys do not depend on u because they live at the boundary. And this is an expansion as u goes to zero. But it's not an asymptotic expansion. This has a finite radius of convergence, and the radius of convergence is when you can draw this sphere. Is, is this clearer now? Yeah, sorry if that was confusing. Yes? Not from locality, from the bulk OP. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't think so. I, was, I, don't, I will not be able to constrain that limit, I think. In fact, I will have to assume something. I will have to assume something about the asymptotics, although we can be very general, but I have to assume something in order to make progress. Um, more questions? Going to need 20 minutes now. So, so okay. So now, so you imagine that you live in the CFT. You have access to all the operators, and you're going to say, "Well, let me see if I live at the boundary of, of some ADS space." So let me try to build an operator like this. So what's stopping you from just choosing only one mu switched on and all the others to zero? Why, what goes wrong? For instance, the two-point function would work. If you just switch on one of these, then you get that all two-point functions with boundary operators would be zero except for one of them, and that one would have the right properties. And it's local. So what does it mean to be local? So the BOE will stop converging um, when I can no longer draw a sphere. And so, for instance, in this representation, I have psi here, and I have, if I have some operator here, now the operator is approaching the projection at u equals zero of this operator, then you see my spheres, I have to draw them like this, more and more. So at some point, I can no longer draw a sphere. So the BOE stops converging. In principle, there could be a singularity at that point. So in this two-point function, that singularity would be, let me write it like this. It would be as x approaches zero. But actually, this is smooth. When x is zero, nothing wrong happens. So this is what we want. Nothing should happen because if this is really supposed to be an operator that's sitting out there in the ADS bulk, as this operator passes under it, nothing should happen because they're far, they're far away. Okay? So this is what we want to impose, that nothing happens as this crosses. Okay? So this singularity should not be allowed. So this works for this two-point function, and you can also check that it works for the two-point function of two bulk fields. So if you use this BOE on the, 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 the two-point function of, of two bulk fields, then you find that it's equal to the sum of some mu squares times something called the bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator in ADS. And this expression is local no matter which mu's you pick. Okay? This is the bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator that people work when, with in ADS-CFT. But, so this expansion is just generally valid for any QFT in ADS. In ADS CFT, usually there's only one term in this sum because you're in free theory. But in general, you need an infinite sum. Okay? This just falls from harmonic analysis. Yes? Well, you have to... No, here I can know... If this guy is sitting precisely under, under Psi in this representation, Yeah, if it's a two-point function, you can do this. Yeah, if it's a two-point function, you're fine. You can all do it. If, if you put it on the disk, I can just rotate. But if there are many operators, then you will not be able to do this. Okay? So, indeed. Um, so, if you have a three-point function, 
So the first non-trivial constraints appear when you have a three-point function. So let us discuss three-point functions, and I'll discuss three-point functions with, with uh, one bulk field and two boundary operators. Okay, so let me discuss psi of x u, and then O1 x1, and O2 x2. So in this case, so the two-point function was completely fixed by symmetry. If this was a CFT operator, it would also be fixed by symmetry. But this is not a CFT operator, it's a sum of CFT operators. And so I'm going to get something non-trivial. And in fact, the ADS isometries in this case tell me that this has to be, a, so let me call this G bulk to boundary. So this can be written as G bulk to boundary delta 1, and then X U X1, G bulk to boundary delta 2, X U X2. And then there's a non-trivial function of a, of a cross ratio. So Z, you can write it as X1 minus X2 squared u squared, u squared plus x minus x1 squared, uh, u squared plus x minus x2 squared. Okay, and so this cross ratio is between 0 and 1 in Euclidean. Okay, in Euclidean kinematics. Two-point function of what? Yeah, yeah. So this is a yeah. It's a it's a function of the chordal distance between the two points. And so it's not fixed because there's you see it's an infinite sum. It's an infinite sum, and you know these coefficients they can be whatever I want. So this is a non-trivial function in general, but it's local. That's my point. No matter which coefficients you choose, this will be local. But it's a non-trivial function, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the cardinal distance. Yeah. What? Excuse me? X u, x1, x u, x2. So it's between this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. Okay? So it's a non. Yes, okay, I, I apologize. And so let me, was there another question? Yes, but uh, there seems to be another channel, right? The there isn't another channel because this is a QFT. So in a BCFT, so what I wrote here is when you take both fields and you expand it with respect to the boundary. And if the bulk theory was a CFT, I could also fuse them together. But here I don't have this. Because this is a, in general, it will be a QFT. I don't have this. Uh, expansion in the bulk. It's the bulk to bulk propagator, yes. It's in BCFT, you would call it the bulk channel uh, block. No, no, sorry, you, you'd call it, it's the boundary channel uh, block. The boundary channel block is nothing but the usual bulk to bulk propagator in ADS-CFT because of this reason. Sorry? Yeah, by analytic continuation, yes. E even in Euclidean, there will be a constraint, yes. Because there will be a singularity that should not be there. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you in a moment. So, so let me first give you an expression for f of z using the BOE. So what's going to happen? Well, I expand this field, so I get mu delta of psi. Then I get this funny differential operator. That's known, and it's going to act on a three-point function. Okay. So this I know, this I know. So this can be computed, and so this becomes sum over mu delta. Let me write it this: 
mu delta psi times lambda 1, 2, delta times what I will call a conformal block. Okay? The conformal block, I can give it explicitly, it's some 2F1. Um, So this might look familiar because it looks just like a usual conformal block in, in 1D theories or, or in the BCFT case. So there's all these funny coincidences that, that happen often. And here, so this block is, it takes that form. And now we can go back of our question, to our question of locality. So what is locality here? So let us consider the case where O2 uh, is at infinity. Uh, the psi is at u equals 1 and x equals 0. And so our cross ratio in this case simply becomes 1 divided by 1 plus x1 squared. Okay? And so the dangerous case is I have my phi here, I have my O1. I'm not writing, this is not big. This is not big. Okay. So, so O2 gets placed at infinity. Psi gets placed at u equals 1 and x equals 0. And then, so what this configuration looks like, I guess the drawing was fine. So there's some operator out here at infinity. And so the dangerous region comes uh, when this guy uh, approaches this projection here, because my sphere goes to infinity and then it touches this other operator, okay? And so the cross ratio with this configuration, you can write it as one, one plus x one squared. So this is indeed between zero and one. And the dangerous case is when z approaches one which is when x1 goes to zero. And lo and behold, our conformal blocks, for people who know two F1s, as you should, when z goes to one, it has a singularity. A log or power law, but there is a singularity there. So even in Euclidean, there, there is some funny business going on there. And more generally, for Lorenz, in the Lorenzian case, but still space-like separated, you can make z larger than one, but still real. And so there's a discontinuity there. And so the claim, the, what is the, the locality uh, bootstrap? So this idea of, it goes back to Kabat and Lifshitz. So tune mu delta such that for Okay. I have to go fast. Now, how do you turn this into a useful statement? To turn this into a useful statement in terms of the mu's, you would like to use the BOE. But the BOE does not converge in this region. That's the whole point. So in the Z plane, um, so the, the boundary operator expansion you can show that it converges, so this is the cut plane, so you can do the usual mapping to the row coordinate. So you can map this configuration to a cut disk, where this boundary here is this cut. So the BOE, in this case, converges everywhere except on the cut. So what we would want to do is take that expression 
And we would, we would want to say that the sum over delta of mu lambda delta uh, times the imaginary part of g delta is zero. Okay? So let me call this p delta. But this is not kosher because you have to take a limit to define the, the imaginary part. This limit does not commute with the limit where the dimensions go to infinity, basically. So the BOE does not converge here, so you cannot write this. So this, in fact, this sum does not converge. It con it's expected to converge only in the sense of distributions, which means that you have to first smear this equation against some suitable functions in order for this equation to hold. Okay? Um, so how can we go about uh, doing this? So maybe it's useful to consider uh, like a concrete example and to think about how in that example we would solve the problem. So maybe I will leave this uh, here. So let's consider a simple example. Uh, consider the case where my bulk uh, QFT is a free field, which I will call Psi. In this case, we know what the dual CFT is. It's simply a generalized free field. Generalized free field is just a theory where you just have weak contractions. Uh, so dual is GFF. And now let us consider the, this three-point function, which I'm going to call a form factor from, this, from now on. Uh, the form factor, so dual is GFF and psi just goes to a unique field in the CFT called phi because it's a free field. So the BOE of this bulk field is simply one boundary operator. So let me call it O, which is a phi. Um, with dimension delta phi. And let me consider the form, fi form factor of operator psi squared in the bulk. Phi x1, phi x2. Okay, so these are CFT operators. Okay. So what is this, this three-point function? Well, in this case, it's very easy to compute. So I have my operator phi psi squared. This is a free theory. So it's just two bulk to boundary propagators. It's just weak contractions in ADS. So in this case, we get that f of z um, is z to the delta phi. OK? And indeed, So the discontinuity is indeed zero, and you can write uh, z delta phi, you can expand it in this basis. In fact, you can write it in the following form, zero to infinity, some coefficients, and then conformal blocks of dimension two delta phi plus two n. So this is mu lambda, okay? So you can check that this, this function admits a representation like this. And so what this is telling you is that the operator psi squared has a BOE decomposition in terms of operators of dimension 2 delta phi plus 2n, which are the double traces built out of phi. So these are boundary operators of the form phi box phi, phi box n phi, okay? And so by decomposing this function, we can read off this BOE uh, coefficients if you know the OP, okay? So you see that even in this simple case, actually the BOE contains an infinite number of operators. And this is just free theory. And so you can ask, well, how would I use locality in this case? Suppose that I was told the spectrum. How could I figure out what these coefficients are? If I, I don't know the function, I just know the spectrum, how would I know this? Um, so this is, a, this is our challenge. And so there are basically two ways of doing it, two equivalent ways.
So basically, you can do things using functionals or a dispersion relation. So here, the idea is smear. We have to take that equation, and since it doesn't hold literally, we have to smear it against some suitable kernels. So we're going to write 0 is equal to the integral of some kernels, which will be labeled, I will call them f of theta n, z. And if you choose these kernels suitably, now you can use the BOE. Recall that this was the discontinuity of the block. And now I'm going to call this Now this is just some function, which I will call theta n of delta. This is a purely kinematical function. All the dynamics are encoded in these coefficients. So these kernels, I will show you how to construct them. And so the constraint now is that for each one of these kernels, there will be some function theta labeled by n. And so my constraint should be that 0 is equal to this, uh, to this sum. So now I have useful constraints, useful sum rules on the, on the BOE data. And so the idea is then is by, by choosing a suitable set of kernels, I would have the identity that mf is equal to zero would be equivalent to demanding that the sum rules vanish for all n. Okay, I'm trading something I cannot use for something that I can use. Now, I could go on and show you uh, different ways of constructing the kernels, but I can also obtain them from here. So. so a different way is, well, let us think about the analyticity properties of my form factor. So let me consider functions that at infinity they behave like, like this, like in my example. But you could generalize this. You don't, basically you can assume any power that you want and generalize the construction. But so for convenience, let me consider this case. So when z goes to infinity, because I'm going to write down a dispersion relation for f, so I need to know the behavior at infinity. So how do I do this? I just use Cauchy's formula. Okay. This is just a clever way of writing uh, Cauchy's formula. Here I chose a particular function that is equal to 1 when z is equal to w. You could have chosen other ones. You would get different functionals. But this one will be useful for the problem at hand. It's one particular choice. And now, as usual, we take this contour and we blow it up. And we pick up the, the singularities of f. But I already told you what are the singularities of f. There can only be a branch cut for negative z. So let us assume that this function is local, so it has no discontinuity here. This is what we want to assume. And at infinity, my choice of kernel is such that there is no contribution from the arc at infinity. Yes? Excuse me? It doesn't, no, it doesn't have to be. That's right. The BOE. You can use the row variable. If it converges for z between 0 and 1, it will converge on the, on the cut disk. Yeah. No, it's not known. You just have to assume that it's bounded by some power. Yeah, if it's exponential, then I think it's over for you. You have to find some fancy kernels. But in all the examples that I know, for instance, you could consider the form factor of more complicated operators than psi squared. So for instance, psi with derivatives. And then you just get z delta phi plus k, plus an integer. So then we can generalize our construction to whatever power you want. Uh, so now, if you use locality, then you can write this as an integral over the cut 
uh, over the left hand cut, okay, there is still, a, so there's a discontinuity because again, I'm, I'm on that cut. And now the claim is that you can again use the BOE because you are smearing some discontinuity. Well, in this case, it's even better because, uh, because F converges here. It co F converges on a multi-sheeted cover of the disk, so it, it converges in this cut. Um, and so I'm going to write this in a clever way. I'm going to say that this is the sum over delta of mu lambda delta, and now I'm going to introduce a function which I will call the, the local block. Yeah. So what is the local block? It's simply what you get when you replace the BOE in F. So you can write it in diff two different ways. You can write it when delta is larger than two delta phi, this is equal you can write it like this, so very explicitly, z1 plus delta phi, w minus z, divided by uh, phi. Notice that this is So this function is actually turns out to be zero for special values of the scaling dimension, in particular when it's equal to these values. Okay, this is because the discontinuity of this function, you can work it out, it's just the discontinuity, well, it's no longer here, but to some 2f1 with a z to the delta, if you work out the discontinuity, it's zero for these special values of delta. Um, so you can use this representation, and when delta is smaller than 2 delta phi, you have to rotate contours and get some other representation, which looks like g delta minus the integral 1 to infinity, and okay, basically you, you get the same thing here, and now it's m of g delta. But now from 1 to infinity. So okay, so what, what have we achieved then? The claim is that if fz is local, then there are two expansions that I can write for it. I can write down an expansion in terms of the usual conformal blocks. Um, or I can use these new functions. Which I call local blocks. And so if the function is local, you have this identity. So what's the point of doing this? Notice that what is L delta? L delta is a function that only has a cut on the left. It's manifest from this representation. It only has a left cut. Whereas conformal blocks, they have both left and right cuts. And this is what screws up locality, that they have a right cut. But this is not true for these L deltas. In other words, this, exp this, this expansion here it's, it's uh, manifestly local. However, there is a problem with the BOE. And here it's the converse. So BOE is fine, but locality not manifest. Why? Because L delta is not literally equal to G delta. It's G delta plus stuff. Okay, and in fact, this stuff can be written precisely as a sum over n of theta n delta times g delta n of w. Okay. In other words, so you've obtained something which is manifestly local, but you had to introduce some states that a priori were not there in your BOE. So this is exactly the same for people who know as the Polyakov bootstrap for the crossing equation in CFT. So here we see that there's a, a, an analog for this bootstrap problem of killing the discontinuity, 
where you trade blocks for local blocks. And so demanding that this garbage vanishes, we recover the sum rules that I wrote here. Okay. Um, yeah, indeed, I mean, the, the, the way that we derive these sum rules, we can derive it by starting with the dispersion relation. The dispersion relation knows about the asymptotics of f. The asymptotics of f, they are interlinked with the asymptotics of this mu lambda delta, right? Okay, but that's, yeah, so I guess that's the legal step for me. Like, if I take this sum over delta mu, mu lambda delta, those are not positive. Yes. Yes, yeah, yes. No, well, I cannot prove absolute convergence of, of the BOE, but I think it should probably be axiomatically should be true. I'm not aware of any such proof. Uh, in examples it is, yes. But indeed, it should be a basic requirement because what is the ordering that you should choose on the states? I mean, uh, probably we want to work with functions where the BOE is supposed to be absolutely convergent. Otherwise, uh, I don't, you know. Cannot make head or tail of things. Yeah, but here we also have lambda. Well, okay, if you consider more complicated the correlators, yes, presumably it would come from this indeed. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 but, but the, the point is that once you have these functionals, you're no longer on the, you can deform the contour, right? Yeah, no, no, this is how you do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, the point. Yeah, so the BOE is not, it converges in the sense of distribution, so you must, uh, smear with an appropriate kernel. So really what you should study, how should I choose these kernels such that this is true? And so something that you can do is that they are an analytic, they have suitable analyticity properties, then you deform the contour into a region where the BOE converges, and then the only place where you have to worry about things is at infinity. And this is where this boundedness condition comes in. This is, well, I wanted to mention, so I, uh, I have maybe 10 minutes, but, uh, so let me just tell you what's the, the, the punchline. So the punchline is that, so we formulated this local, uh, this local bootstrap, and we've constructed these functions. So these things are known explicitly, and the claim is that any local form factor has to satisfy these sum rules. Okay, and so now this is a useful representation of the locality constraints. So if you want to do numerics, for instance, you can combine the constraints across of these ones because you really have well-defined uh, sum rules that you can work with. Okay, and uh, so there are many things, many loose ends that I should mention. One thing is this issue that you just pointed out, which is the, qu the question of swapping. When can you swap these kernels? This I believe I have under control. You just have to worry about this period at infinity. Uh, the other thing that uh, you might wonder is, there is some subtlety in what I've done here because I said, if the discontinuity is zero, then the sum rules apply. But I really also want to show the converse, that if the sum rules apply, then I have a local function. So I want necessary and sufficient uh, conditions. And so the similar problem in the case of the crossing equation, uh, we were able to prove this, but the proof was uh, quite tricky and it relied crucially on positivity. And here there is no positivity, but nevertheless we were able to prove it because what we did is that we are able to prove, we were able to prove that these kernels, they form a basis of L2, okay? So if you assume that your MF uh, is in L2, just L2 uh, on this interval from one to infinity, which you can map to zero and one, we proved that these functional kernels, they form something that's known as a Ries basis uh, for L2. Ries bases are very nice because they always come with the dual bases. The dual bases is the basis of conformal blocks. And so the statement is that we have these 
Extremal functionals, in this case, are those which form a Ries basis, and they always come together with an extremal solution made up of the blocks which are dual to these functions. And in fact, so we, we, we proved this for, for these special functions which are dual to the generalized free field solution, but actually we can construct, in this case, the, uh, the analog of interacting functionals where the spectrum is very non-trivial, and we can construct form factors where the spectrum here is just some crazy random values of delta, and we can compute all these coefficients. So that's something that uh, I think is very interesting because it suggests how you could proceed uh, to do the same thing in the crossing equation case. Uh, and then uh, regarding uh, the flat space limit, uh, so regarding the flat space limit, yeah, it's interesting to consider the flat space limit. So I've been calling these things form factors for a reason. So what is the flat space limit? The flat space limit is, suppose you have a QFT with a mass gap, okay? With a mass gap, then basically you get for free an infinite family of boundary CFTs, which are labeled by the dimensional plus parameter M gap times radius of ADS. So you can put the QFT in ADS, but the ADS can have many sizes, so you really have a family of CFT correlators that you can play with to study the QFT. And the flat space limit, so flat space limit uh, is where the radius of ADS goes to infinity. And this implies, since the theory is gapped, that all dimensions go to infinity. All the scaling dimensions of this boundary CFT all go to infinity, except the identity. Uh, and so you might uh, try to understand what happens here for these uh, form factors. So this procedure has been studied for, for boundary correlators without bulk insertions. In, the, in that case, there's a very nice story where you, you show that the boundary correlators, in a sense, literally become the S matrix of the QFT in the bulk. And so here the claim is that um, if you have, you start off with this correlator, And so in the flat space limit, this will become where So basically just the, the, the statement is that if you, you take this f of z, this thing that I call the form factor, and you just take this limit where all the scaling dimensions go to infinity, then it will become the, the flat space form factor, meaning the function uh, psi of x with k1, k2 in the QFT. Okay, so a purely flat space quantity. And we can derive a phase shift formula for this form factor in terms of the boundary CFT data, but this maybe I can ex tell you offline. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so for instance, there are some people who have done some mixed bootstrap between S matrix and form factors. And so you can think of our construction as telling you how you could do this for the CFT when you deform things to finite radius, and then you can think of taking the limits and playing with all these things. I think it just becomes it just becomes the dispersion relation basically. The functionals are so simple that in this limit it just becomes the validity of the dispersion relation for certain kinematics. That's that's what it becomes. Uh, but you can do lots of cool things. For instance, you can see that for imagine that your 2D QFT is an integrable theory. Then in the flat space limit, you can show that uh, the expression that we get from the form factor is perfectly consistent with Watson's equations for the, the form factor. So the absence of discontinuity maps to one of the Watson's equations, and the fact that the discontinuity across the, the negative Z-cut gives you the S matrix, we can also see this from this phase shift formula. Um, but of course, our construction generalizes this for any QFT, even if it's not integrable, and in any space-time dimension. Um, so I think I'm already over time. There will be lots of more things to say, but maybe you can ask them offline. Thank you. Thanks, Miguel. So we had uh, questions, but I think there is time for one or two more. Uh, 
Yeah, so when you have this QFT in ADS, there is, a, there is no stress tensor on the boundary CFT, so you question what happens in that case. So in that, this is related to this problem that in the presence of, of gravity, um, there are no local operators, they must get dressed, they are not gauge invariant. Uh, and so, well, I'm not sure about the graviton, but even just constructing just a scalar operator is non-trivial in this case. So what we expect is that this constraint that the discontinuity of F should be zero gets modified, because now the way I should think about operators is that they have atta attached some Wilson line. There are many ways of dressing operators. You could dress them with Coulomb field as well, but you can dress them with the Wilson line. And so now you see that as my local operators cross this point, they, might, they can see something, okay? So you expect that there will be some, even in gauge theories, that you have expect at least some singularities that look like this for some power. So the question is characterizing the form of the discontinuity that can appear at this point in the presence of gravity. And in, when the boundary theory is two-dimensional, since you have Virasoro, then there are proposals for, this, uh, for what this discontinuity should be, and in the presence of a gauge field uh, as well. But uh, regarding construction, you can also construct spinning fields. This logic would apply for, for spinning fields, we just have not done it yet. We focused on scalars, but indeed we should also look at uh, things that have spin in the bulk. A Lagrangian. Yeah, it's tall order. Yeah, the Lagrangian in the bulk is very clever, uh, even though we don't like to say this. It's, it's clever from the point of view of the bootstrap because it incorporates all, cro all crossing conditions, right, regarding all operators, whereas in the bootstrap we just do things one at a time, and it also incorporates all the locality conditions at the same time. So turning the logic around to reconstruct the Lagrangian, we would have to study the, this problem, including all these constraints at the same time. If we don't, we can never reconstruct the full uh, Lagrangian. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, indeed. In, this, in that case, they have to couple to, to gravities. So in my procedure, I didn't consider the case where the external field has spin, but anyway, I tried to do a little computation. It seemed like it was perfectly consistent with what I'm saying here, and you get a singularity that looks like this. And the point is that even though I focused on the case where the discontinuity is zero, it's good that this construction can be generalized when the discontinuity is some known function. Right? It would just mean that in these sum rules, instead of the right-hand side being zero, it would be something that's fixed by some dynamical constraint, uh, and then you could still fix all these couplings. Yes? It is that. It is that. So, uh, so does, when Z is larger than 1, you can see that this corresponds to the bulk operator being space-like separated from, from the boundary operator. So nothing should happen. So the discont this M of F is precisely the commutator of the field with the boundary operator at space-like separation. Not when MF is different from, Z well, in this case, where you have some Wilson line, operators will not commute, even at space-like separation, because this Wilson line is running off to infinity, and it talks to the boundary operator. So you expect a non-zero commutator, and in actual computations, you see that it's there. So the key is you want to formulate some kind of, of course, if it's just some completely random theory of quantum gravity, it's just hopeless, you cannot say anything. But you might say, well, if it's a theory that's weakly coupled with weak curvature and blah, 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 then there should be some scheme. I mean, our world, right? It admits very closely local operators, right? So, and I, I, so th that means formulating what this discontinuity is, sup is supposed to be. And it should be universal in some sense, given these assumptions. But this is, the, this is a dynamical question that I don't know how to address at this point. Okay, let's thank Miguel again for the nice. Talk. And we'll continue at eleven thirty with